Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. I'm very excited to be here today with Julie Love, who is not only going to share her story with us today, but she has also agreed to be a guest speaker at our upcoming festival, Happy and Aligned. So, Juri, I know that you are all about turning adversity into gifts. So let us hear a little bit about you and your story. Thank you, Trina, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Love. I am originally from Japan, but I live in America. And my job right now is a journalist and TV film producer, musician. Um, I do community service through Rotary Club and I'm a single mom of two. Yeah, you got the most incredibly amazing, impressive list of accomplishments. I really admire all the things you do. There's charity work while raising your kids and being an entrepreneur and all of that. How is that for you as a sensitive person? How do you manage all of it? So I have learned a lot going to Berkeley College of Music, mm. doing so much work. When I went to Berkeley College of Music, um, I learned like super time management when mm. I was at college. Mm. And we're going to maybe come back about the sensitive part of it, but um, just an example of time management mm -hmm. when I was at Berkeley College of Music. As you know, music takes time to learn oh. and you have to go to practice all the time and you're throwing out new music all the time and it's it's fun. And then it so many classes and then so many concerts, it just thrown at you every day and you sleep like two hours. Oh four hours and they get back again and play music which was which was great but it just takes time to do music and I gotten better at it but along I think Berkeley College of Music truly helped me how to do the time management and not get overwhelmed so yeah because it does sound overwhelming I must admit yeah. yes but at the same time, uh, it was so much fun. Mm. And I would say um, when I was pregnant with my first son and I was uh, doing musical theater, Annie Get Your Gun, and I was running a nonprofit and I was finishing up my bachelor's degree. I was taking 12 credits and it was just so much going on. Mm -hmm. and teaching, driving pregnant <laughs> and then but I somehow managed and then I got like 0.0 um wow mm. yeah so I'm pretty good at multitasking and I usually don't get overwhelmed much that's very impressive yeah well done and I like that you said that it was so much fun is that I find that when we do things that give us energy, it does become a bit easier to, to have a full schedule. Yes. And I don't want to do things that I don't want to do. So I'm intentionally doing things mm. that I really enjoy. And then that yeah. becomes um, really center of your life. So when I graduated from Berkeley College of Music, I really wanted to um, do like a lot of music jobs and I got to go on the tour. Um, wow. I was playing for um, Boston Ballet School, um, Boston Conservatory, a lot of musical gigs. It was really, really great. It's been wonderful playing at the club and it was so great. And, and that was while your son was an infant almost or? So this is before my son was born, like right uh -huh. after. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. But uh, right now I am doing a lot of fun things like producing movies and then being a journalist and a storyteller. Mm. And I'm part of the Rotary Club. Tomorrow I have a, a district conference and I've done many impactful international and local projects as well as yeah. developing some program 
in the community. I got nominated for an award uh, coming up in the local theater. I didn't. I don't know who nominated me, but I got nominated for an award for creating opportunity for youth. Ah, that's so beautiful. Congratulations. That's well deserved. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about what you find enjoyable and how you sort of choose what feels right for you to be doing? Yeah, so I really choose what I want to do and I'm really grateful that I get a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. and I feel I put so much work, hard work, networking and intentional um, movements that led me to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful that right now I'm pretty much doing what I want to do and then be okay with. So I think a lot of it is manifestation, mm. you know, law of attraction yeah. and really going through adversity taught me a lot when you talk about sensitivity and mm -hmm. understanding other people's need and compassion but Absolutely. also like my intuition since I've been exposed to so much violence growing up and adversity and not understanding what it was mm -hmm. I feel a lot more compassionate about people who's going through hard time yeah and I feel at this point in my life, I can leverage people's lives where they are struggling because I went through that. Mm -hmm. So my focus is not only doing what I want to do, but really give back to the community and give back to the people who could possibly use my experiences and expertise. Mm, yeah. And be there for them. Absolutely. And I think that's that's the, one of the best parts about going through hard times, isn't it? That's when we get to to pay what we learn forward, so that other people might be saved a little bit of the heartache and and the hardship that we went through. So, do you feel like there was a before or after in the sense that from what you learned? growing up with violence and abuse and all these things or did you always have this sense of what was right for you what you wanted to do so I think I was very passionate child I was very bubbly I think oh. I was very um stubborn in a way <laughs> I had like a big wheel like as a child um so just an example, like mm -hmm. my mom is a musician and then she uh, asked me to be in her band, rock band, and she's, mm -hmm. she's 68 and she's still performing. But That's, um, so cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Like rock band, like really, really rock. And then with her husband and then her high school mate. But anyways, um, when I was four, like I knew that I didn't like the outfit that she put on me. And I was crying. I said, Mom, this is not good. This is not a match. So please take it off. But she didn't. So I cried so much. I ended up not performing with her. So that was where I was for. So I've always knew I always knew what I wanted to do in my life since even like four years old. That's that's really a gift, I think, and a strength. <laughs> Even, I, I bet your mom didn't think so in that moment. Yeah, no. <laughs> She hated me. <laughs> yes. Oh, but that's something I remind myself when my kids, you know, are going against what I want them to do. I, you know, I try to take a breath and, and remember that it's really healthy for them that they have a sense of who they are so that they don't just, you know, do everything I want them to do just because I'm their mom. It, it, there has been some adjustment and I've had to get used to some of it. They are uh, 19 and 22 now. So 
I had my say in it and now I have to trust that that they know who they are and that they can live their lives and I like watching that so but again I remember when they were little and had their own opinions that wasn't always easy but um, yeah but to answer your question about the sensitivities and um my intuition definitely horned after um, surviving the adversity and surviving yeah. the abuse and then being homeless. And mm. when you are in the middle of crisis, you just really rely on your intuition. And I remember when I was homeless in Tokyo, mm. um, I, I just didn't know what to do. I was 18 and everybody else was going to college after high school and being like, you know, having a great life where yeah. I was like nowhere to go. And at that moment, like it's a lot of surviving skill. Yeah. Not only when you are getting abused, but when you are completely homeless, you just really have to rely on what's right for you. It's mm. more of survival mode. Yeah. So I had no money, but I had a, a little bit of saving and i actually spent like a dollar which is like a hundred yen it's like a coin and to um we didn't have internet back then so i bought this job magazine mm. and um i found this resort hotel where they feed you and they provide accommodation and you can work mm -hmm. so i called from the public phone and then i needed work and He's like, when can you start? So I said, tomorrow. I remember that phone call very well. And he said, okay, you can start working tomorrow. And then I took train and uh, he came to pick me up. So I was there for what, like a month, but I could definitely go to a different path where, mm -hmm. you know, I could be a completely like bum and then just not yeah. do anything yeah. and maybe do drugs or mm -hmm. alcohol and sex and all that stuff. And then... Yeah. But I, I just didn't, and I just made a choice that I don't think I'm going to be homeless forever. Wow. And yeah. it just realization. And mm. I think my intuition in the survival mode and actually survive through it um, helped me to yeah. be who I am right now. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can definitely see how having to rely on your intuition when you are in those extreme circumstances and how that actually got you through it. I guess you can't deny that intuition after experiences like that. And you mentioned law of attraction. Was that something you were aware of back then or was it just sort of this sense that you had to follow that inner guidance so i read a book called magic and then um mm. that's when i really learned about the law of attraction but um or manifestation so these are the things that i learned along the way i didn't know exactly and i didn't know um how powerful your brain can be mm. and subconscious can be yeah. so in a way that like say I can tell you good and bad. So the bad is like, so when you are subconscious is like losing mind and then you are mm. used to getting abused, bullied, and yeah. you manifest that and then you mm. attract these people and then you don't even realize that you are in an abusive situation. Yeah. Um, but the other spectrum is that if you manifest law of attraction and if you really feel that you're a winner and then you're beautiful, you're strong and you're brave mm. and those things comes to you, those things can come to you, but also like something more specific, um, tangible things say, for instance, I always wanted to be on Japanese TV and huh? a couple of years ago, five years ago or so that um, I was writing a blog and then a Japanese TV producer contacted me to be mm -hmm. on the Japanese reality show. And that uh -huh. has been always my dream. 
Yeah. And my son just got really amazing opportunity at Nessen, which is a sports network, New England sports network, ah. to be a reporter for the Boston Red Sox. And this happened wow. two years ago mm-hmm. before the pandemic. And mm-hmm. then after the pandemic, everything got canceled. Mm. And for the two years, they didn't have the program. And then I was so hoping that someday he will get it again. And then yeah. he got it and he just had another second episode recorded yesterday. But I just had this like vision that mm. he will be on TV. I just had a vision that he will be the chosen one again. And I think those thoughts and images as more spe- spe- specific, mm-hmm. um, I think it can come true. Um, yeah like even like colors and smells and like even dates, all that stuff. Um, That's what I learned along the way. Mm, I like that. And it reminds me of something my brother told me many, many, many years ago, because he has always been successful in anything he wanted to do. And I was pretty much the opposite for so many years growing up. I felt that it was so unfair that everything was working out for him and nothing was working for me. And one day he said to me, hey, sister, you know, the only difference between you and me is that I believe I can do it. And I knew he was right. I just didn't manage to turn it around for way too long, but I still knew that he was right. So I love that you have had that sense so strongly for such a long time and that you got to hold on to it even through everything you've been through or maybe maybe enhanced because of it so that definitely is a beautiful way of looking at it because you could have been telling a completely different story about how horrible it was and how how unfair it was to you but you choose to turn it around and, and pay it forward. I, I really admire that. I think it's very inspiring. So, thank you so much, Trina. Yeah. Thank you. That means a lot. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm curious about growing up in Japan and then moving to the States. Have, what have you experienced, if anything, regarding being sensitive in, in those two quite different cultures, I imagine? Sure. So that's a big question. And then Mm. in terms of sensitivity, I have learned being a Japanese woman in America is really, really interesting experience. (laughs) And I have definitely pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Um, So in Japan, as a woman, we are trained to devote our life lives to men and then um good and bad like you know Mm. if you're single you're kind of shamed and then embarrassed it's it's really bad and you're trained to be the best wife and then Mm. you almost don't have career and then not so much you know women leadership in japan Mm. so that part i really don't like and i like that part in america but still like that brainwash and training for my life is affecting me although I'm in free country mm-hmm. so I remember like my doctor was saying Julie you're in America you don't have to be ashamed to be a single and oh, yeah. you know you don't have to worry because I feel the value in this country for women especially um there are many leaderships um vice president of a country's women yeah and it's just a lot different than Japan and you can take more confidence and leadership mm-hmm. as a woman and go for it. But yeah. I really didn't learn much, especially subconsciously, mm-hmm. um, till like really later in my life. I knew I was a leader. Mm-hmm. I knew that I ran a nonprofit for 12 years as president and founder. And I feel in back of my mind, always felt not awkward, but not full force because mm. of my gender and because yeah. of my culture. And I didn't like that part of Japan. That's why I came to America. 
mm-hmm. yet I don't feel like I took a full advantage of this mm-hmm. country and freedom and then the leadership and respect towards women. Um, so it's just a subconscious thing. There are opportunities and I definitely took advantage of these opportunities um, being in America than being in Japan. Mm-hmm. Yet my subconscious mind has been blocking my potential as a leader, as a um, somebody that can maybe do more. Do like, even more. I, I do, yeah. Well, yeah, I do a lot of things, but in like subconscious mind, that's like the sensitive part of it. Like when you talk about analyzing your mm. life, that, yeah. Um, yeah. I could have excelled more if I had a realization of a potential, um, not because of my gender and then devotion to men that I was mm. taught to do yeah. um, as a Japanese woman. Um, sometimes I feel like I wasted a lot of time for devoting my time and money and love to a wrong person (laughs) and then just, Mm -hmm. you know, failed in a way. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And, um, I feel that being a Japanese woman, sometimes like, you know, say, okay, you're single you're not valued, you are not validated, mm. kind of like a social pressure. So I, I, just, yeah, I just try to yeah. stay away from those voices and then, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. just go after my dreams. But yeah. that takes courage. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. I think those little voices in our head, they, they are sometimes the biggest enemies of, of getting to live the lives that we really, truly, deeply desire and deserve. But I couldn't help thinking that maybe in a way, you know, having that contrast made you more aware to actually go for it because there were more opportunity in America. Because I suspect that there are a lot of women growing up with with that opportunity who either sort of takes it for granted or still feel like ah well men get to run the world so I don't have I I can't get that far but but you were you had the awareness to to do it and I think I think there's real power in that as well and I mean you are aware of that inner little voice so I don't think you're done writing that story, are you? About what you can do? You're so right. And mm. to be honest with you, um, that was the cons a little bit. The pros about being sensitive as a Japanese woman living in America mm-hmm. is some of the cultural background. For instance, we have this word called omotenashi. And omotenashi is hospitality. Mm. And then... This is some deep, deep rooted culture of Japan. Like omiyage is like souvenir. So when you go on trip, you are obligated to bring omiyage to everybody you work with. So like a little chocolate and little things. And then um, it's it's very weird culture, but I was shocked when I was working in America and when somebody goes somewhere, nobody brought any omiyage ah. so i'm like because i brought omiyage to my colleagues yeah. and then they're like what are you doing <laughs> you know <laughs> and i and then so for instance like you know i tend to like really hear the needs of people and mm. then or be sensitive and then what they want and then i'm producer i'm film producer like i try to write thank you card to everybody which is kind of our culture like yeah. you know, write hand, hand written letters after something mm. you know grateful happens, or bring gifts to somebody's house when you're invited, and those are like really deep rooted culture that um, it's not really in America, but um, they really appreciate my gesture, yeah. and yeah. I think that makes me a little bit different than maybe other um, leadership because of my cultural background and the Mm. training yeah yes I understand why they call you the goddess of connection isn't that the way it is because those 
little gestures, they can mean so much, especially in a world where people aren't accustomed to it. So it really stands out, doesn't it, when people, and, and I think that's why there is such a need for sensitive people, because the world can easily just be so busy and cold and goal oriented that bringing in those little warm gestures that can really remind us of what's important and that connection is real and that we have to make an effort to keep keep our connections and expand them so yeah so for I say sometimes I make mental note in mm -hmm. those uh, okay for example like very recently I was producing a movie and then one of the actor commented on my croissant like photo on my story and I remember that she said croissant gets me or something so I'm like um the movie set that when I went there, I made sure I got a croissant for her. <laughs> so like a little chocolate croissant and she really appreciated it. Yeah. And, you know, just a little gesture like that mm -hmm. um, can make people um, feel special. And, yeah. you know, being sensitive means like, especially as a leader, like listening to people's fav favorite, thing, favorite things. And mm -hmm. like my DP really liked this pink drink at Starbucks. So, I made sure I got that for him. And I saw an yeah. uh, audio person really liking the matcha uh, latte. I saw her drinking it. So I brought it to her. Yeah. And then, so it's just like a little things. But I think what you were saying about goddess connection, um, not too intentionally, but I learned over the years being a leader that connecting with people not mm. just you know giving expressive things like not materialistic things but listening to people's stories and mm. then especially also being a reporter being a journalist Ooh, when you yeah. meet strangers yeah. um like and then you have to interview in like mm. such a quick span sometimes yeah that building rapport is so important and then i think being being you know, able to listen yeah. to um, the needs and then what they want to say. Um, I think that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. I think we all have that craving of being seen and heard for who we are. And I really think that's a gift that sensitive people have when they are aware to use it. So I, yeah, sounds really powerful. I like it. So the final question is about what you would like your legacy to be, how you would like to impact the world so we can have a brighter future. That is a big question. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know about legacy part, but I feel my mission really is to give back to the community mm -hmm. because I am here um, with so many mentors, guide guidances, and mm -hmm. so many people believed in me yeah. and so many people encouraged me and then show me the path that I wanted to go when I had no idea that how to, for instance, start a nonprofit and yeah. how do you do that, how to publish a book how to you know produce tv shows mm -hmm. and i have so many people just you know said yes to me when i asked questions and when i you know wanted to accomplish something or do mm -hmm. run into some challenges i had so many people who advocated for me or who showed me mm -hmm. okay this is the person that you need to talk to um this is where you have to go etc so yeah. that's why i am where i am where i feel um a lot of things that i'm doing right now is mm -hmm. super cool yeah. <laughs> and i think i think um i can be those person those uh individual mm -hmm. not about legacy but um that i can make an impact like one person at a time but also, I'm interested in systematic change mm -hmm. and 
I'm not a politician, but as a journalist and as a filmmaker yeah. and a storyteller, I feel that I can shift like some of the frequencies and some of that notion and then mm. normalize some difficult com- conversations such as yeah. mental health talk. Yeah. Um, adversity, starting my podcast as well and then mm-hmm. thank you for coming to my show as well and I think what I want people to remember about me is that this Japanese woman who came to America and devoted her life to impact the world and help people that actually did something impactful in their lives yeah. and that's what I want people to be remembered about me oh I love that and I I know you have already had that impact, the stories you share on your podcast and in your book. And I love that we got to connect and and share our commonalities. So absolutely, I'm sure that every time we stand up for who we are and share openly and honestly who we are, I believe that even that just spreads like, like ripples to help others do the same. So so thank you so much for being here and helping me share the story. And I will put your your links in the show notes so that people can, can reach out or follow all the amazing things that you are doing and are gonna be doing. Thank you, I appreciate that Trina. Mm, thank you for being here and have a beautiful day. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It was a pleasure.